Good morning. I'm very excited to be here. I still have to find out why. Um, I got this invitation from uh, Christian, introduced by a common friend who is also a client of mine that I respect very much. So I took the invitation without thinking. I never heard about this festival before. And then when I looked at the website, I said, he, he must have been wrong. He must have been wrong. I shouldn't be here because I'm not an artist. I'm actually a failed engineer. Um, you will see that in the presentation. So my presentation is going to be very ugly, OK? So for all of you artistic-minded people out there, please uh, bear with me. I have a special relationship with time. I don't like to be late. This time I've been asked to be late because uh, some people are still drinking their coffee, but uh, it makes me feel uncomfortable to be late. I, did, I, I didn't used to be like this. I used to be like most Romanians, very relaxed this time. But once I had a Swiss boss, and um, he called management meetings Monday mornings at 9 o'clock. And by 9.20ish, uh, he was pulsing a vein here. Because we would come in uh, leisurely. We would tell Bruno, how are you? <laughs> You look a little bit tense today. <laughs> and eventually, finally, he, he couldn't take it anymore, and he burst. And he told us, please don't do this anymore. And we told him, what, what are we doing? What's wrong? He said, you are taking every day something from me that you can never give me back, something that is extremely important to me, extremely precious, and you can never give it back. I said, what? He said, you take 20 minutes of my time. 20 minutes of my life every Monday morning. Because if I call you here at 9 o'clock, my culture and my upbringing is such that I cannot not be here at 9 o'clock. And then you take 20 minutes of my life every Monday, ever since I couldn't be late anymore. And this relates a little bit to the subject of today. Because what Bruno did with this message, he made the link between a value that we shared which was respect for each other's lives, and the behavior that we didn't, which was being on time. And this is something that we need to do if we want to work well with others. We, we need to make these links. The problems that we have is not that we don't share the same values, but we don't share the same behaviors and interpretation of them. This is what we call norming in social sciences. We don't share the same norms. People say you go to a different culture, they have different values. It's not true. They have different norms. He, he then went on to tell us this story to, to help us understand why he's so adamant about being on time. He said, you have to understand where I come from and how I was brought up. I'll tell you this story. I once had to meet my father after work. And I told him, look, let's meet at 7 o'clock at Leap. If you know, Zurich, Leap is a beer house. A big and famous beer house in Zurich. So let's, let's meet at Leap at 7 o'clock. Because I come from outside the town, it's going to be rush hour, I might be late. But don't worry, I'll be there. Just take a beer, relax, wait for me, I'll be there. I'll do my best to be on time, but he knew what, whom he was talking to. Know? And uh, he came to the beer house at pa 5 past 7. And he, as he was going in, his father was going out. And he told him, what? What are you doing? I told you I might be late. He said, yes, but five minutes. I mean, how late can you be? <laughs> I can start with my subject. I'll tell you one or two words about myself just to see where I come from. I'm a failed engineer. Um, I graduated engineering in 1985. I was thinking that this year is a very important year for me. Uh, a couple of months, three months uh, on, at the end of December, there is going to be more year, more time that I spent outside of communism than inside of it. I will have, I will, will have a majority free life starting December 23rd this year. I was exactly 29 when communists fell in Romania. So at 29, uh, I started a different life. 
like overnight. And uh, I started uh, to, as an entrepreneur. Then I sold my company to a multinational organization. I worked for them a few years. I realized it's not the life for me, so I left it. But it was a very interesting life. Very full, very full of uh, lessons, both good and bad. And then I started doing consulting work, which I do still today. And my main, if you want, interest is about organizational culture, leadership, and values, the role of values in organizing work, if you want. And this is what I'm going to talk about today, about the, the social enterprise, I call it. I expect that in an artistic-minded community like yourselves, there's going to be a lot of people leaning to the left, liberals, as the Americans call it. I'm not one of them. I'm a capitalist, and I believe in capitalism and free markets, and I think that capitalism has brought a lot of good in this world. So what you're going to hear about the social enterprise is not an enterprise that tries to introduce, how should I put it, justice for all. I don't think this is possible. What you're going to hear is a case that we have built our organizations wrong, or at least we have built them wrong for the time that we are living, and we should reconsider. And I'm going to tell you why I think we should reconsider and how I think we should reconsider. And I'll start with this. I don't know if you have read anything about this guy or written by this guy. His name is Jeffrey West. He's a theoretical physicist. And he wrote a book which is called Scale. It's a technical book. It's a scientific book. He deals with the subject, why do organisms scale the way they scale? Why is an elephant bigger than a mouse? And how can it happen that an elephant is bigger than a mouse? How can it happen that you are born like four kilos, and you grow up to, let's say, 100, but not to 500. What stops you at 100? Is there a science behind this? Surprisingly or not, there is. And the science looks like this. There is a link between the size of an animal and its metabolic rate. The larger the animal, the slower the metabolic rate. Actually, it's not the slower the metabolic rate, but the slower the metabolic rate per kilo. Yeah? Because obviously, an elephant needs much more energy than a mouse, but not per gram. Per gram, it needs actually less energy than a mouse. So there is a sort of economy of scale, if you look at the way life scales. The bigger the animal, the more efficient the use of energy. And therefore, they can they can uh, live and survive with relatively little food. Relatively is not massively, is this. Oh, sorry, I forgot you can't point with this one. It's this, beta 085. What does this mean? This, this slope here is a logarithmic slope for you who still remember your math, which means that every line here is an order of magnitude. So every line there is 10 times bigger than the, than the previous one. And beta is the slope of this slope, of, of this uh, curve, of this line. And what does it mean? It means that when an organism doubles its volume or mass, its use of energy doesn't double. It only increases by 85%. So it doesn't increase by 100%, but by 85%. What does this mean? It means that if you have 1,000 the mass, you actually use phenomenally less energy per gram. Another thing that means, and this is philosophically interesting, is that if you live a full life, you don't die from a disease, you die from old age, you will have the same number of heartbeats as any other mammal. A, a mouse 
lives for three years, an elephant for 200, you live maybe for 100, you have the same number of heartbeats. Because the way they deal with energy requires mice to my heart to beat very fast. What does this have to do with enterprise? Well, he went on to understand why this happens, and then he asked himself this question, does this apply to other sorts of, a, of, of uh, let's say, networking? Because this is based on the way cells are networked. This theory is based on the way th cells are networked. Does it apply to other kinds of networks? What looks similarly to an animal? And the answer is a city. And guess what? Cities ob obey the same rule. So the bigger they get, the less energy they need per capita. And this might sound con counterintuitive to you, but the, the greenest city in USA is New York City. It's not a small rural village. New York City uses less energy per capita than a small village, actually by a factor of 10. But cities also have a different behavior that is interesting, and this is this one. Not only do they have, do they use less energy per capita as they scale, but they produce more output. So if you see here, beta on these curves is super linear. That means that when they double in size, their productivity more than doubles. And the graph on the left, every dot on this chart is a city, from very small to very large. And, every, and this is the line that shows, on the left, its total wages. That means the, the bigger the city, the more wealthy the people. And the second one shows you um, creative output, output from creative work. All sorts of work, not just art. Yeah. Then he said, but companies are also networks of people. Let's look at companies. And guess what? Companies don't have that. They actually have it opposite. Companies decrease their effectiveness, their output per capita as the number increases. They, they increase their efficiency, but they decrease their effectiveness. Cities increase both efficiency and effectiveness. This is incredibly powerful. This is why people gather in cities. It's incredibly powerful. In companies, we take this as for granted. I mean, it's normal. OK, we are bigger. Now we have to have rules. Rules slow us down. It's more bureaucracy. It's more politics. It's inevitable. Is it? Cities survive without them and do very well. What can we learn from cities? So in order to answer this question, I want to, st to start with a game. And this is the game, OK? We're going to play it together. And it goes like this. I'm going to ask you to make a decision. And your decision is very simple. You can choose A or B. That's it, OK? Now, Assume that these numbers here mean something to you. Assume that they are something that you want. Yeah, let's say because it's easy for everybody. Let's say that each one of them represents, I don't know, $1,000. So one is $1,000, two is $2,000. The output that you get from this game, the outcome that you get from this game will depend on your decision, but also will depend on the decision of somebody else in this room to whom you are going to be assigned and paired randomly. You don't know whom, OK? And you don't know what they're going to cho choose. You're going to make your choice, and then I'm going to pick somebody else and say, what did you choose? And then you two get or don't get something out. And how does it work? If both of you choose A, both of you give me $1,000. If one of you chooses A and the other chooses B, the one that chooses A gets $2,000 from me, and the other one gives me $2,000. The opposite happens, it's symmetrical. So if you choose B and the other person chooses A, you give me $2,000, the other person gets $2,000. And if both of you choose B, both of you get $1,000.
Okay? It's clear? Yeah? Ready to play? Okay? Mesdames et messieurs, faites vos jeux. Think about it and choose. Ready? Everybody has chosen? Okay. You cannot not play, okay? Let's make this rule. Okay. Now, who chose A? Show of hands, please. Okay. One th About one third of you chose A. The two thirds chose B, right? Can we have two microphones in the, in the room, please? I want, I want an argument for A and an argument for B, please. Who wants to argue for A? Why you chose A? Can we have a microphone there, please? There's a raised hand there. Hi. Hello. Uh, a was not my first choice. B was my first choice because it looks like a sure win. And then I thought maybe um, most of the people think like this, and then if I choose A, I get to win more. Okay. So your argument, so your logic was B looks like a better choice. That would make many people choose B. And then if I choose A, I will get more. And now it's a better it's a better bet, right? Yeah. That's the argument. Yes. Okay. Any other argument for A? Anybody has a different reason for A? We have a hand there, please. Can you just pass it on? She's right here. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, I did this exercise a lot of times in university. Okay. And so. And I am surprised that <laughs> now <laughs> less people choose A. Yeah. But I was thinking of B, and then I realized the game, and I knew people will, a lot of people will go for A. Okay. So, okay. so you, you knew it, yeah? You, <laughs> you, took a, you took an economics class or a game theory class in university, right? Okay, fair enough. Okay, let's move for B. Who wants to argue for B? We have one just here. Um, my choice was based on expectations. I was like, I thought that B would win because in the room probably we have lots of artists which are more willing to share. Okay, so, so your, think, your thinking was B is a win-win solution, right? Yeah. And people will choose B because it's a win-win solution. Yeah, I chose, I chose B because I, I was sure that B was wi winning, so I would win one million dollars. Mm -hmm. But you also have a win-win mindset, right? Yeah. Because if you knew everybody would choose B, and if you didn't have a win-win mindset, you should have chosen A. Yeah. Right. So you say, well, I have a win-win mindset, and I assume that people in the room have a win-win mindset. Yeah. That's why I chose B. OK, any other argument for B? Can you pass, the, please, the mic? R right here in the first row. OK, thanks. Uh, so I think the win-win mindset works when you're playing multiple rounds, and my expectation is that we're going to play multiple rounds, so I'm going to trust you the first time and hope to, both of us win, but... To give a signal, right? Yeah, yeah? but okay. uh, to, to, yeah, to give a positive signal positive initially. Signal. Okay. But afterwards, yeah, it can go other way. So. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's a good point here. Yeah? It depends on whether you do this once or you do it multiple times. It depends on whether you do this with people that you don't know or with people that you know. Okay? Now, here's the catch, and why, why, do I, why did I want to have this game played first? This is a game that, if you go to a game theory class, you'll find this game in the first 10 minutes of the class. It's the most famous, most basic, and most interesting, in my opinion, game in game theory. It's called Prisoner's Dilemma. And it's a dilemma because, obviously, let's say, let's say the options are cooperate or defect. The best option is that both cooperate, but you cannot rely on it. And there is an incentive for both people to defect. And then what is going to happen? Are you sure that the other person is going to cooperate? Because they have an incentive to defect. Here's the problem, and here's why this happened. 
This, by the way, um, game theory is a class that is taught in economics. If you look in the curricula of uh, universities, it's taught in economics. And it's taught in economics because this is based on what is called in economics the econ. There is a fundamental assumption in classical economics about the behavior of people. And it says this. People are rational maximizers of their personal, their own utility. When they have to make a choice, people will choose the option that maximizes their own utility. What do you think about this? Is it true? No, it's not true? Hmm. Can we go for dinner together? <laughs> Why, why do you think it's not true? Who, who thinks it's not true? Can you have a, can you pass the mic? There's somebody back there. <coughs> Sorry, my voice. Uh, <laughs> I know that uh, we as humans developed because we could uh, take decisions for the group, not for ourselves. This is what uh, difference us from uh, apes. Okay. Or from other mammals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying there is a social component to this, which this theory doesn't capture, right? Okay, good point. Any other reasons why you think this is not true? The, the reason it's not true, it's all the work of uh, Daniel Kahneman and uh, Amos, uh, I forgot. The, Tversky. The yeah, yeah. Yeah, and many others, by we're, the way. We're not know? rational. Yeah, but Mind you, what Kahneman says is not that we are not rational. He says that we are not always rational, okay? There are instances where we are systematically biased and our decisions are systematically rational. Okay, that's true as well. But mind you, if this assumption would be fundamentally wrong, you should throw away all the economics books. And basically, you should throw away everything because this is how the world is designed. You, you have a point? I think like we are choosing rationally and efficiently until a certain point. So like I think the curve um, increase and but then it reach like a peak and then start decreasing because like human beings are also uh, looking for happiness and happiness don't go like always along with efficiency. Okay, so, so you, when you say curve on this axis you have rationality. Yeah. yeah, rational, I mean, uh, yeah, you said like uh, um, efficiency and okay. choice. Utility, yes, and not yeah, efficiency. Yeah, utility, sorry, yeah. You might not want utility, your utility might not be efficiency, okay? Yeah. Your utility might be love, for instance. Whatever is your utility. The case is that you make the rational choice for your utility. For instance, when you buy an expensive uh, love watch. Love is not rational. Yeah, but it's still utility. When you buy an expensive watch, yeah? You buy it because it gives you status, maybe. Status is your utility. It's not a rational utility. It's an irrational utility. But you rationally buy the watch that makes you, yeah, if you have to choose from different watches, you will choose the one that maximizes your status, if, if status is what you want. That's the economic theory, at least, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the catch and the problem. The problem is the following. If this would be 100% true, then everybody should have chosen A in this exercise. You understand why? Because A is what is called in, in game theory the strategically dominant choice. It's strictly strategic dominant choice. What does this mean? It means that whatever you, if you choose A, whatever the other party chooses, you end up better. So if you choose A and the other party chooses A, you lose one. But you, if you had chosen B, you would have lose, lost two. So losing one is better than losing two. You end up better. If you choose B, uh, sorry, if you choose A and the other party chooses B, you get two points. And if you had chosen B, you would have gotten only one. So getting two is better than getting one. A is the rational choice. The problem is that the other party knows that A is the rational choice. And then you end up here. And when you end up here, 
The problem is it's very difficult to get out, isn't it? The first one who tries to make a step out of this position will lose. And there is a strong incentive, even if it's not the best option for you, to stay in it. It's called the Nash Equilibrium. It has been invented by a guy called John Nash, who died two years ago in a car crash, a brilliant mathematician. The problem with Nash Equilibria is that they are very difficult to break. And even when broken, it's very easy to get back to it. This very simple game explains a lot about human behavior, explains a lot about what is called in economy the tragedy of commons, what happens with resources that are exploited in common. Basically, they are depleted. Think about fossil fuels. Think about fisheries. Think about anything that we exploit in common on this planet. Think about the fact that we use one year of resources of this planet in about three months. And it's very difficult to maintain it if you take it out. Uh, Nordic countries uh, sign treaties about how to deal with fisheries every year. And every year somebody breaks them. This explains, anybody in here was uh, living in a, in a, on campus in a, in a dorm room in university? Yeah? It explains why your rooms in the campus looked the way they looked. Because it would be best if both people would tidy up and clean a little bit, right? But the first one who doesn't clean goes for a beer, and the other has to clean for them. So pretty soon nobody cleans. <laughs> Wasn't it the case? Yeah? So what's the problem here? The problem is that if you act like a rational actor, you are condemned at this kind of um, inefficiency. It's not the worst thing that you can get, but it's not the best thing that you can get, and it's very difficult to avoid. Building organizations rationally is a recipe for mediocrity. You cannot plan excellence. You cannot plan creativity. You cannot plan achievement. You can plan golden mediocrity. You can make the minus one be minus zero five, or minus zero two, maybe. You cannot make it two. It's impossible. In order to make it two, you have to have something else here. So let's get back to your discussion about B. People said, actually, both arguments about B were like this. Even one of the arguments about A was like this. B is a social choice. It means that we understand that we are better off winning together than winning against each other. And by the way, we are both better off, OK? It's not a personal sacrifice. We are both better off winning together than winning against each other. So people will probably choose B. But look what happened in this room. About one third of the people chose A. Imagine that we would have done this in the real life. If you had chosen a, and you were paired with an A, what would you think? You would think you made a good choice. Because the other person chose A, if you had chosen B, you would have lost more. If you are an A and you're paired with a B, what do you think? You have made a good choice. You win too. Your assumption is right. If you are a B and you're paired with a B, what will happen? It's fine, yeah? I, I took the right decision. People are social. But if you are B and you are paired with one third of this one third of the class, of the room, which is A, you say, shit, people don't think the way I thought they think. I, sh I have to change. And pretty soon, this will permeate the group. And pretty soon, the group will be A. It's what I call the unifying power of shit. And it goes like this. If you have a barrel of wine and a barrel of shit, you take a, a spoonful of wine and you put it in the barrel of shit, you get a barrel of shit. If you take a spoonful of shit and you put it in the barrel of wine, you get also a barrel of shit. Shit is stronger, okay? That's the problem. 
It's a joke, but it's serious, okay? She is stronger. <laughs> so if you are really, really believe in win-win, this means that you have to give win-win the same weight in your life that you give to winning against others. If you did that, if you did that, this game would be different, right? Because if you did that, the, the maximum personal utility is two. If you give two, your maximum personal utility to win-win, the win-win position will become 3-3 three, three here, because this is the only position that follows the win-win mentality. So you would get 3-3 three, three there, and all of a sudden your Nash equilibrium moves here. Yeah? And then we would all cooperate, but we all have to want this together. Now think about the way we build our organizations. We have individual objectives. We have individual performance metrics. We have individual bonuses. We are, we are building organizations to be antisocial. Not antisocial, asocial. And then we put values on the wall. Everybody, anybody in here works in an organization that has values on the wall? Can I have a show of hands? Do they really exist in, in, in your life? Why? Did you ever ask yourselves why? I know you do, because I have clients. And the people in my clients' organizations ask themselves why. And they give themselves this answer. This is corporate bullshit. Somebody's trying to brainwash us to work more. But it's all a lie. It's hypocrisy and lies. Now, this would have been the good news. This would have meant that there were people there who are trying to lie to you and fail. That would make them better at lying. So after a while, they would be so good at lying that you wouldn't realize that they were lying anymore. This is not the problem. The problem is that they are sincere. They really do want the organization to work like this. They really do want people to interact with each other in this way. But they build systems that go against it. Totally. And they don't understand. So in order to have a social system. And by the way, this is how cities work. Yeah? In order to have a social system, you have to have a system of social norms that keeps this alive. And the most important norm here is we need to care for the common good. We need to care for the common good. And we need to understand that the common good is not achieved at my expense. It's actually, it makes me flourish as well. If you ask people to sacrifice themselves for the good of others, you get saints and martyrs. Saints and martyrs are called saints and martyrs and no, not Joe and Mary because they are rare, okay? This is not how you build societies, asking people to be saints and martyrs. But you should ask people to understand that working for the common good is also working for their own good. And this is how you build effective organizations. Cities do this because they work socially. Do we have a social norm to care for the other? Is care a social norm in our societies? Yes is the answer. This is why we have it. Yes is the answer. Is it true for all societies? The answer is yes. Go in any society and you'll find that the main pillar of common morality is what is called the golden rule. Sometimes it's phrased negatively, minimalistically, don't do unto others what you don't want to be done unto you. Sometimes it's phrased even more generously, maximalistically, do unto others what you want to be done unto you. Our philosopher Andrei Plesiu says that even this is minimalistic. Because the golden rule should say, do unto others what they want to be done unto them. <laughs> but if, if we stick to the, to the level two, it's still very fine. But it's not the only rule that should, we should have socially. We should have others. Can you imagine which other rules we should have? Social norms, these are not rules, but norms. 
we should have in order to make this happen? Yeah. What? See? Yeah, it's the same rule. You're right, but it's the same rule. Yeah? Care for each other. The common good is important. But there are others. Sorry? Yeah, trust. Very well. Why trust? Yeah. Because now imagine what is happening. We are cooperating together. I have to trust you that you are going to follow through your commitments. If we go together and say, let's do this together, then I have to trust you that you are going to do it together. And you have to trust me, yeah? Do we have a rule about keeping commitments in the society? We do. <laughs> yeah, we do. And it's a strong rule. Doesn't this come in conflict with, the, uh, with our natural tendency to be, uh, I don't know, risk avert or loss avert? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It's not easy to maintain this position. If it would be, I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't need consultants. We have to live as well, you know. <laughs> but you're very right, it does. And it does go against our animal nature and our instinct. We also need another, we need other rules as well, but we also need one that is very important. Think about the unifying power of shit. What do you need to have? You have punishment, yeah. You have to punish the offenders. And you have to be very strict about it. You have to be very clear. You have to be open and caring and understand their point, but at the end of the day, not following the social norm is not an option. And we do have this, don't we? This is why we have prisons, by the way. That we abuse it a lot of times, it's another discussion. How you build that into society is another discussion, but you need to have this social norm. Now look into our organizations. To which extent do they care about the common good? To which extent do they build trust in each other? To which extent do they punish the offenders, by offenders meaning people who do not follow the social code? And there is where their value system fails. Now, I want to address a little bit, I, I wasn't thinking about it, but maybe I have enough time to address a little bit your comment about going against our risk aversion. Have you, uh, any of you um, had their genome sequenced? No? But you know that there are a number of companies now who can do this for you, and they will tell you who are, your ancestors are and where they came from and stuff like that, right? The first one that started this is uh, National Geographic. In a project with IBM, it started in 2005, just after the genome, human genome was sequenced. They had this idea to exploit this commercially. That means to, you, you can apply on, online. They will mail you uh, a kit with two vials and with uh, swabs, cheek swabs. You swab your cheek, you put them in the vials, you mail them back. Uh, you have a code. After two weeks, they send you an email. You click on the website, and they tell you everything about you. And then with this code, you can log into other websites of partner uh, organizations that do even more deep dig in the data set and tell you even more interesting things about yourselves. But one thing that they can do by regression analysis, they can tell you where your ancestors come from. And because they can tell you where your ancestors come from, they actually can tell how they got there. And because they can tell you how they got there, they can tell you where they came from. And because they can tell you where they came from, they can answer this question. Is there Adam and Eve? What do you think is the answer? Yes. There is, yeah? All the genes of all the people in the world primarily come from a primordial couple that lived in Central Africa somewhere where on the Great Rift, African Rift in Tanzania, like 200-ish thousand years ago. Now, this population grew, but went through a major extinction about 70,000 years ago. 70,000 years ago, there was a problem. We don't know which, but there was a problem, and our species was reduced to 3,000 individuals. And then they discovered something, and they started to explode. So much that they had to move out. And they moved up north, the Nile Valley, then to the Mesopotamia. This was 70,000 years ago. 
So Sahara was not a desert at the time. The climate was um, much colder. It was a nice age. Then they moved through Asia. Most of them, some of them moved to Southern Europe, but most of them moved through Asia. And then from Asia to Southern Asia, then island hopping Indonesia, island hopping to Australia. Then they crossed the Bering Strait into the Americas and went from North America to South America. This is why big civilizations like the Inca are only 500 years old, because uh, they arrived there pretty late. And when the ice started to retreat from Europe, they started to migrate back. And basically, they're still doing this from east to west. Now, what's interesting in this story is that when they migrated to Asia and then to Europe, they found other people there. They were not the first. We are not the first species to populate the Earth. Not hominids, I mean homo species. In Europe, there were the Neanderthalians. In Asia, were the Denisovans. And they were established. The Neanderthalians were populating Europe like 20,000 years ahead of us. And Denisovans even more than that in Asia. So they were established populations. We went there and we extinguished them. And the question is, how did we do that? One of the, one of the answers was through assimilation. We interbred until you can't distinguish between the two species. It's wrong. The average European person has about 2% Neanderthalian DNA. And the average Asian person has about 6% Denisovan DNA. So there was interbreeding, but not that much. So what happened? Initially, we thought that they were stupid. This is why we call Homo sapiens sapiens. We're very clever. It's not true. We know now that it's not true. Neanderthalians were stronger than us, more agile than us. They had the, pretty much the same tools and the same science, if you want, of building tools. So how did we do it? The answer that anthropologists have now to a large extent is that we invented society. Homo sapiens invented a way to cooperate in large numbers that no other species has displayed before us. All species cooperate in small numbers, but we manage to cooperate in very large numbers on very large areas. And there are a number of things that helped us do that. One of them is social norms. These social norms that we have are more sophisticated than in any other animal group. All the animal groups or advanced animal groups have social norms, at least the ones that uh, cooperate and work or live together. But our social norms are incredibly powerful and very sophisticated. And we pass them on from generation to generation. The second big thing is religion. Not religion as we understand it today, but imagination, if you want. The ability to work for imaginary stuff. Anybody here works in a corporation? That is in your imagination, OK? It doesn't exist. It only exists because you believe it exists, OK? Anybody in here has cash in their pocket? That's imagination. It's a piece of paper, OK? It doesn't exist. It only has value because we all believe it has value. And this is something that allowed us to cooperate on large scales. Now, fast forward to the 19th century. We started to build large organizations. This works very well in small groups. It starts to work less well in large groups and less organized. We build large organizations for the first time, mines. Then a French mining engineer, Henri Fayol, comes along. And he writes a theory about how to run mines. And he's the first one that established the principles of management, which says forecasting, planning, organizing, uh, staffing, and controlling. This is how you do management. 150 years away from that, if he would rise from his grave, he would be very proud of himself, because we still run organizations this way. But our organizations are not mines. And this is not the 19th century. What is the big difference between what we do today and what they did then? Why is it that this concept worked very well for almost 100 years, and now it doesn't? And the answer is that the world at the time was very predictable. 
And this type of running organization, command and control organizations, allows you very predictable planning, but it requires a predictable environment. It doesn't need social values because all you are asked to do is do your job. I don't care who you are or what you think, just do your job. And if you do your job, it works well. So cooperation is not a matter of social cooperation, but it's a matter of process cooperation. The co process cooperates for you. You have to just follow it. But this doesn't work in this world, because this world is not predictable anymore. In this world, we deal with situations that are unpredictable, unplannable, and have to change sometimes from quarter to quarter. I had this discussion with a client of mine, and she told me, we have this problem with our managers. I want you to take them. I, I also teach in an MBA. So they said, uh, you have these executive programs. Take them and build an executive program for them to be more agile. And I told her, if we do this, half of them are going to quit. And they said, she said, why? Because agility is an organizational trait. It's not a personal trait. When you have people that are in agile like this, generally speaking, when you have people that systematically behave in a way, there is a system that drives the behavior. Unless you have a systematic way of recruiting and keeping the most in agile managers on the market, it's not their problem, it's your problem. So until you solve your problem, it's pointless telling, sending people to training. And their problem was basically this. The more your the more your system relies on rules, the more predictable it is, the more efficient it is, but the more rigid it is. The, more, the less rules you have, the more space you have for people to innovate, for people to express themselves, for people to put in their own energy in. But here's the catch. If you take away the rules and you leave, you leave a void in the space, if you don't fill this void with something, the system will collapse, and many times, Customers of mine tell me, yeah, but we tried this and it failed. Like, we have 20,000 procedures in this company, so we had a big, big exercise last year to reduce them to 10,000. Usually this means that they have doubled the pages. But reducing from 20,000 to 10,000, even doing a genuine effort to increase the space of autonomy to people, doesn't solve the problem. Because there is nothing that keeps them working. There's nothing that keeps them going. So you have to fill the space with values. You have to build a social element in the organization. And you have to be really, really serious about it. For instance, in the case of my, my uh, customer with the agility, I asked her, these managers that you sent to us, are they on a performance plan? And she said, yes. Do they have a bonus if they achieve their performance targets? She said, yes. How many of them achieve their bonus every year? She said about 90%. Forget about agility, OK? This is a system designed against agility. Why? If you get your bonus every year, what is your purpose in life? What is your purpose in work? It's not to lose it, I tell you. Because you pay your children's uh, education with it, or you pay your vacation with it. If, you, if your obsession is not to lose something, what do you do? The natural inclination, you do what you always did, okay? You do what you know works. This is against agility and against innovation. Tell me at the middle of the year that you change my objectives, I'm in panic, yeah? I'm not embracing this, I'm scared by it. So the system has to be built differently. And here's an idea how to do it. There is always this discussion about the difference between management and leadership. I'm going to give you one. And you're going to see it's very, very imperfect. But I'm not giving you this definition in order to make it perfect, but in order to make it clear. And I'll tell you why it's imperfect as well and how you can deal with it. And the basic difference is that management is a discipline based on coercion. Coercion has three pillars, establishing expectations, metrics, and incentives. So any system that has expectations, metrics, and incentives, it's a coercive system. Even if the incentives are positive, it's still coercion, because motivation comes from outside. Leadership is attraction. Leadership is based on common destination and common values. This is what leaders do. They inspire people to a common destination, and they build a moral system around it that allows them to cooperate to achieve that. 
That means that management deals with extrinsic motivation. Leadership deals with intrinsic motivation. These are two very, very, very different types of motivation. I'm not going into these details, but if you go and read literature about it, they have very different um, ways of working. That means management speaks to the rational part of your person, and leadership speaks to your emotional part of the person. A very famous psychologist that I really admire a lot, called Jonathan Haidt, uh, made this metaphor once, which is a very, very inspired metaphor, and says like this, our mind is like a rider riding an elephant. Your emotions are the elephant, your rationality is the rider. You cannot make the elephant do something that it doesn't want to do. You can only steal its energy. And now, how do you provide the elephant with energy? Well, you can provide it from inside, or you can provide it from the outside. So the, the, the rider can motivate the, the elephant giving them bananas or something. That's a way to motivate. It's a rational way of motivating them. But if the elephant doesn't want to do something, will not do it. It's stronger than you. Management and professional is not the right word here. I should have changed it. It's transactional. Management is transactional. It's give and take. Yeah? I do this. If you do this, you get that. Yeah? If you don't do this, you get that. People can work in transactional paradigms, and they can also work in social paradigms. There's a very, very famous case about, about this with the Israeli um, kindergarten. One of these researchers, the, most of them are Israeli. Kahneman Israeli, Tversky Israeli than a really Israeli. And um, when he was a, a young researcher in, in Tel Aviv, he had his kids in a kindergarten, and they had this problem that people were coming late with the children. And it was difficult to deal with that for security reasons and stuff. So they pleaded with the parents not to be late anymore, and still some were late. And they said, OK, from tomorrow, we can't take this anymore. From tomorrow, it's a $50 fine if you come late. What do you think happened? A lot more people came late. Why? Because now it's a service, OK? It's not a social problem. It's a service. Here's 5,000, and don't bother me for the rest of the year, yeah? Because now I can buy it, yeah? And then they realized that it's not the right way, and they took the, the fine out. What do you think happened? Even more people came late. Because it's a service, and now it's free. <laughs> it's on sale, OK? It's easy to move from social to transactional, but it's very difficult to move me back. Oh, come on, I was wrong. It's, it's still social. Uh -huh. It was transactional yesterday. Huh? <laughs> so it's very difficult to move people back. Beware of building a culture in which people do things for money or reward, because it's very difficult to change. And it doesn't work. It works suboptimally. So management puts the weight on the process. The process deals with stuff, deals with cooperation, deals with um, organizing work, deals with giving feedback. The process is the key. Leadership is social, so they put the emphasis on how people behave and interact with each other. And they, leaders know that people can do this by themselves if you put them in the right environment. Therefore, management establishes rules, and leaders establish values. Therefore, management generates compliance. If you, if you have been in such a system, and I'm sure you have been in such systems, you will know that management works like this. We have a plan, and then every month or every quarter, we look at deviations from the plan, right? There's an assumption built into this that nobody talks about. Do you, do you feel the assumption? The assumption is that the plan is perfect, yeah? OK, but what if the plan is not perfect? What if you live in an environment that you can't even plan? Leadership generates engagement, engage, engages people into the work, and makes, makes the work part of their life. By the way, I hate this, this thing about work-life balance. I think it's stupid. It means that at work, you don't live. You live, and you have to live well, OK? Management generates control. Leadership generates alignment of people. If you align people to a destination, they can police themselves. You don't need to control them. Management deals with budgets. Budgets innervate, stress energizes, uh, Jack Welch used to say. Um, 
Leaders lead, deal with ambition. Ambition is different than budget because it cannot be planned. And sometimes it's not achieved. And it doesn't matter if it's not achieved. It's, it's enough that we are ambitious and we can follow our dreams. Management deals with incentives. Leader, leaders deal with meaning. The most underused force for good and progress and performance in organization is meaning. Organizations don't really care about putting meaning in people's work. There is a lot of research in this, and it basically doubles the output. Think about this, it doubles the output. I have this discussion with managers who said, my people are demotivated and I cannot motivate them because I don't have a budget. And I tell them, I can give you 100% budget right now. Give them meaning, okay? It doesn't cost you anything. And they will be happy. So management deals with KPIs, objectives. Leadership deals with roles, goals, missions. What is the overarching purpose here? What are we trying to achieve? What's more important here? There's a big discussion here. In, in my MBA class, we have one day dedicated to this because it's a big discussion. Management is about centralizing decision-making and power. It deals with this paradigm that we have a group of people, a small group of people at the top who think and plan, and then we have an executing body, and the rest is deployment. Leaders empower people. They move power down. They move power or the problem arises. This is what gives the organization flexibility. And by the way, this is why, this is why cities are flexible. Nobody tells you where to buy your house or where to move or where to, or to shop. You tend to do this where is best for you. And if many people do this, this creates clusters of opportunities and which attract other people. Management is obsessed with planning. Leadership is obsessed with adapting and building adaptive systems. Leadership, management speaks about reward. Leadership speaks about recognition. A lot of time I hear this in my customers, reward and recognition. It's a bad paradigm. Reward and recognition are very, very, very different things. You should never put them in the same basket, never. You compromise both if you put them in the same basket. Again, there's a long discussion about this. But just to give you a small example, I had this discussion once with a customer, a bank, and they had a, a system that was based only on, on, let's say, business objectives, numbers. And they wanted to introduce this idea about how, how you do your job, not just what. Fair enough. So they spent about four months negotiating how much space to leave for how in their system. And they finally decided for 30%. So your achievement was 70% number, 30% how. But how do we define the how? How do we measure the how? Well, we have values. And luckily enough, we have six values. So we can give each value 5%. You cannot rank values. Values are values. They are all valuable. Each one 5%. OK, but the first value was integrity. You could rob the bank and get 95% performance. OK? The second value was cooperation. You could rob the bank and be a jerk with all your colleagues, and you get 90% and they paid bonuses from 80%. You could actually violate three quarters of the values of the company and still get 80% performance. It doesn't work this way. You don't pay your kids to be good, do you? At least I hope you don't. <laughs> it doesn't work. Recognition is different than reward. Recognition is value-based. Re reward is transactional-based. And finally, Management requires and generates predictability. Leadership requires and generates flexibility. This is the biggest problem. It's the biggest problem because it's the biggest reason why management fails today, and also is the biggest reason why it's very difficult to change. We have built an entire system of corporate governance based on predictability. And nobody has the guts to try to change it. It's very difficult to change. So, I'm not going to go into the discussion of how you change it, because it will require a few days. But what I'm going to say is this. It works for everybody. And you need to understand that if you want to build an organization that is capable and adaptive and agile, you need to bring more of the social values in. 
How much more of the social values you need to bring in, I think, goes like this. And there is no, I don't have a, a magic instrument to measure this. But you have to think to which extent my world looks like this or like this. And then where do I put the line? And if I put the line here, what does it mean? How much space for autonomy and decision making do I leave to my people? And now how do I fill it with leadership? How do I fill it with intrinsic motivation? How do I fill it with alignment? How do I fill it with a sense of purpose and mission? And how do I teach my managers to be also leaders? And finally, the question that I get from my managers or my customers is always this. What do I need to be, a manager or a leader? If you are in this work, the problem that you have is that you do not have the luxury to choose anymore. You had it, but you don't. You have to be both. There are no organizations that need only managers, and there are no organizations that need only leaders. You have to be both. And this is why my paradigm is false. Because management, like the left column, or leadership, like the right column, does not exist. They coexist in the same person in the same system. But you have to understand that they are different systems, radically different systems that do not mix. And you have to mix them like a space, not like a pot. They are not uh, on the continuum of an axis like this, but they are a space. And you have to fill this space, and you have to fill it intelligently. And this is my case, my engineering case for the social enterprise. Thank you.